Last week after worship, I got into a conversation with longtime members here at Grace, Catherine and Bob, and they told me about their marriage and what has kept them married for several decades. And Catherine said the key to their marriage, it's been this, every day they dance together. Every day, she said. Here's a photo of the two of them. I love it. The, the secret to the success of their marriage dancing every day. And, and nothing has, nothing can separate them from this, this love. And it's also an image of God's love for us. Paul writes that nothing, nothing can separate us from the love of God through Christ Jesus, our Lord. And we've been studying through Romans and drawing lessons from this book. Uh, each week, we've highlighted specific passages to focus our attention. And so, so this week, as we turn to a highlighted passage of scripture, uh, one that I, I really want you to, to sit with over the week and, and to take with you wherever you go throughout the week is this. Say it with me. Nothing can separate us from the love of God through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Before Paul writes these words, he talks about the law and the love of Christ. He, he really holds these things in tension, the law and the love of Christ, uh, the role of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And, and he talks about suffering in the Christian faith. And, and each of these things seem like opposites or, or they're held in tension, but, but Paul brings them together and he talks through them uh, here in, in the book of Romans. And the question of suffering, uh, it's one of the most challenging questions of faith that we have. In fact, many walk away from faith because we can't comprehend a good and loving God who, who would allow suffering, uh, who would allow pain and heartache in our world. And, and we experience hardship and suffering as part of our life. It's part of what it means to be human. And, and some of you, I know some of you have experienced untold suffering. We ask the question, where is God in this? Where is God in suffering and pain and heartache and hardship? Where is God in that? And what I wanna to do today is help us make sense of this question and, and to help us make sense of suffering. Even as Paul says, nothing, nothing can separate us from God's love. So, so let's, let's dive in. If you have your Bible, uh, turn to chapter seven. We'll be working through chapter seven and chapter eight uh, in the book of Romans. And you know, I, I know that I move fast. Uh, it's the only way we're going to get through Romans in only six weeks. And, and so, uh, you know, as I speed us through this, you might just make note to come back to read a passage of scripture later. There might be a part of Romans that you underline now and uh, you wanna return to, to spend more time with and, and to, to study in. And what I wanna do is, is really take us through this book so that we understand its major themes, the depth and the breadth of this book. Uh, and so Paul, he, he begins this chapter with a discussion about marriage. There were debates about the religious law and, and a question would often come up. Well, when a husband dies, when can a wife remarry? Uh, Paul says after death, of course, right? And so for us, this question, it, it seems a little bit odd. Uh, in the ancient world, there were different patterns and practices. And, and Paul uses the example to tell us something about, about the law. And Paul recognizes there are both Jewish followers of Jesus and, and Gentile followers of Jesus in the Roman church, and, and they're worshiping together. They're, they're following Jesus together. And, and so there's some tension around these practices of the law. The Jewish followers of Jesus, they believed that, that you needed to follow the law. Every one of the 613 commandments of the law of Moses. Now, the Jewish people would have turned to these. They would have used them to guide them and to understand God and and so the Jewish Christians, as they began to follow Jesus, they would, they would attend to those laws, the dietary restrictions. Uh, they attended to the festivals. They, they followed each of these laws as best as they could. And, and in this Roman church, they, they believed the Gentiles, who were you know, non-Jewish followers of Jesus, they, they believed the Gentiles should do the same. However, Paul, he, he teaches something different. He, he says, he points to God and says that, that God has made a new covenant with humans. The law of Moses was the old covenant, but Jesus has brought about a new covenant. And, and a covenant, you might think of it this way, it's, it's an agreement, it's a, a contract between people. Uh, we talk about marriage as, as a, a covenant. The covenant of marriage brings two people together, binds them together in love, in partnership. 
Um, at, at the Last Supper, Jesus said uh, to his disciples, this is the blood of my new covenant. He pointed to himself as being, being the thing that binds us together. And so Paul, he's, he's making the point, borrowing from even what Jesus would say about him own, himself. And, and he'd say, you, you who follow Jesus, you no longer follow the law. We are free from following the law to prove our righteousness, righteousness to God. And what, what Paul's saying is that it isn't the law that, that proves that, that we're made right with God. It isn't how, how well we attend to the law or, or by doing all the right things, we prove our relationship with God. No, Paul, Paul's saying that it's our faith in Christ Jesus. It's our faith in Jesus that leads us closer to God. And so again, Paul, what he's doing here, he's, he's using an illustration. He uses marriage as an example. If a husband dies, the, the wife is, is free to remarry. The, the covenant has been broken by death. She's not bound to the old covenant. And, and similar with Jesus, with Jesus, we die to the old covenant and we enter into a new covenant. Here's, here's another way to think about uh, what, what Paul is saying about the law. So Claire and I, we've had to register our vehicles in the state of Massachusetts. And uh, finally, I got my Massachusetts license plates and that feels like a really big moment. Uh, they're on my truck now. And uh, when I drive down the road, I feel like a real Massachusetts resident. Anyway, I, I realized I didn't have the title to my truck. So as we were trying to get the license plates, uh, I realized I had to go back to the state of Kansas. Now, I only had the lien release from when we paid off the truck in Kansas. So, so we had to prove to the state of Kansas that the debt was paid to get this title. And, and Paul says something similar here. He's saying with Jesus, the debt has been paid. Our debt has been paid. We are released from the law. We no longer follow the law, but we follow after, we have to follow after Jesus. And Paul spends the entirety of chapter seven talking about the law. We had, we had, uh, he had more to say. He, he had a lot to say about the law. He, he goes so far as to say that, that the law was powerless to help us be righteous. And the law might tell us what we should and shouldn't do, but, but we fail miserably to live up to it. And sometimes it, it even makes us worse. Here's what Paul writes. Uh, he, he says this, but now... By dying to what once bound us, we have been released from the law so that we serve in the new way of the spirit and not in the old way of the written code. And Paul's talking about the law here. And, and, and he goes on, what, what shall we say then? Is the law sinful? Certainly not. He's saying the law in and of itself isn't, isn't bad, but he, he goes on, nevertheless, I would not have known what sin was had it not been for the law. For I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, produced in me every kind of coveting. Paul's saying, I, I wouldn't have done this if I didn't know I shouldn't do it. And, and we get this. As soon as we're told not to do something, we want to do it. I, I think about the sign in the store that says, do not touch. Whatever the item is, I know that I'm drawn to touch it even more. Um, I, I came across an example of this uh, that highlights this illustration perfectly uh, by Robert Caldini. He's a, a psychologist and, and he ran an experiment in the Petrified National Forest Park in Arizona. Uh, the park had a problem. See, people would take small pieces of petrified wood as souvenirs. And uh, there were signs throughout the park that said that collecting of that wood was prohibited. There were signs that would say, you know, something like, your heritage is being stolen every time you steal a little piece of this wood. And, and something like 14 tons a year, mostly small pieces, would be taken out of the park. And so uh, the warning was there, but, but as a psychologist, he wanted to understand, you know, if the sign was actually effective. So his team put pieces of petrified wood on various trails. Some, some had the sign and then others didn't, you know, saying don't, don't collect anything. And then other trails just had nothing. And the trails with the warning sign had nearly three times more theft than the trail without signs. It's remarkable, right? The, the moral appeal to the law itself, it doesn't assuage human behavior. And Paul simply says, we are led away from the good that we want to do, even when we when we don't want to be led away, or, or even when we mean to do good, we're, 
we're simply led away from it. He, he writes this in verses 14 and 15. He says, we know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. And he's, he's not just talking about himself. He's, he's talking about all of Israel. He's talking about all of us. He's talking about the ways in which we fall short and, and find ourselves stuck in addiction or, or lust and pride or, or being self-absorbed, all the ways in which we fall short, the, the ways in which we carry regret, we carry hurt. And so Paul, he, he cries out, he, he cries out for really all of us when he says this, he says, what a wretched man am I? Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? And, and then Paul gives us the answer. He says, thanks be to God. Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And Paul, he, he keeps reminding us that we've fallen short. The law can't rescue us. Only Jesus can do that. Only Jesus rescues and redeems and saves us from our brokenness, the, the consequences of sin and guilt, and gives us new life. And this, this leads to chapter 8. Um, and, and chapter 8 includes some of the most beautiful and beloved passages of scripture. This is how, how Paul begins uh, chapter eight. He says, therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. And what we do is we, we simply accept this gift. And so instead of condemning us, Jesus draws us to him. He sets us free from sin and death. And, and he does this through the Holy Spirit. Uh, when, when we say yes to Jesus, the Holy Spirit begins to work in us. And, and so here's what, what Paul says. He says, you, you, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God lives in you, and if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And, and here is what Paul is saying. When we live according to our body or, or to the law, really we're, we're dead. But when we belong to Christ, we find new life and the Holy Spirit starts to work within us. And, and so what, what does the Holy Spirit do? The Holy Spirit is, is our help. The Holy Spirit is our guide. The, the Holy Spirit convicts us and inspires us. And, and when you feel the nudge or the tap on your shoulder to to care for someone or, or to serve someone or to reach out, to offer encouragement, to, to do good, to do acts of justice and kindness and mercy. Often it's, it's the Holy Spirit at work within you. Earlier this summer, we, we had a, a wonderful group get baptized at Heart Pond and uh, Pastor Ruthie and several of our staff were there to baptize these 13 individuals. You can see them here in the photo. It was just a, a wonderful, wonderful day. And we think of baptism as initiation into Christian faith. Sometimes we proclaim faith through prayer, but, but also baptism is the outward and visible sign of an inward spiritual grace. It's a sign of our relationship with Christ. And through something outward and visible, something as elemental as water, God does something within us. And what we say at baptism is that you're, as you're submerged, you, you die to the old self, you reemerge from the water and you're made new. And then we pray, may the Holy Spirit fill you. May the Holy Spirit lead you and guide you and, and form you and shape you and console you and empower you. This is what the Holy Spirit does within us. And so Paul, Paul, he says that for those who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. When we're, when we're led by the Holy Spirit, we act as children of God. We do the things that God wants us to do. And we, we live with the Spirit uh, wherever we are, wherever we have influence. And when we surrender our lives to Jesus, when we, when we follow after him, we are then freed from the letter of the law. And we're, we're, we're brought into new life with the Holy Spirit's help. And this becomes essential to facing all that comes to us in this life. And, and so now what I wanna do is talk, talk about suffering and, and how it relates to our faith. Paul writes about suffering, he, he says this, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. And what Paul is doing here is making clear that, that we will suffer in this life. 
And Paul might be referencing the hope we have in heaven, our, our eternal home. But, but I believe he's also talking about how God works in our lives despite suffering. Suffering, hardship, death, and, and loss, it's, it's all part of what we experience as humans. Uh, one of the reasons people um, walk away from faith, uh, one of the reasons that they give for why they walk away from faith, it, it has to do with suffering. And, and you've likely asked this question before, you know, why does a good God allow suffering? Why do we experience pain and heartache and hardship and, and trials? Why do we experience these things? And, and some of you have experienced significant suffering. I think about cancer diagnoses. I think about the loss of a loved one. Maybe it's a lost job and, and we find ourselves disappointed with God in these moments. We, we wonder, God, where are you? I, I found myself listening to several news stories about the violence in Lebanon this week. And the first day, you know, several pagers exploded, killing Hezbollah militant group leaders. Hezbollah has been labeled a terrorist organization and. And then the next day it was, it was their radios and Israel's military surveillance had infiltrated leaders of the group and used their devices to kill them. But my, my heart ached hearing the stories this week of kids and, and parents and grandparents who were killed because, because they were nearby. And, and of course, Israel's offensive comes out of a tragedy that occurred on October 7th last year or something that, that never should have happened and in so much violence, innocent children and, and families and loved ones suffer. And, and so we ask, where, where is God in all of this? Paul says, he, he says that the whole earth cries out. The entire cosmos groans in pain. It, it cries out, ringing with, with hurt and heartache and suffering. This week, I, I talked with one of our families who lost a child uh, a little bit of time ago. And she was only 13 years old. And this week would have been her birthday. And her dad said simply, she should be here. And he's right, she should. You know, in these moments, we're not always certain what to say. Sometimes we'll say to our friends that we try to comfort or to others that, that we care about, you know, everything happens for a reason. And, and we're just not sure what to say or how to respond in those moments or to, to make sense of suffering and tragedy. For those who've gone through suffering, who've experienced heartache and tragedy and loss, this hurts, it's, it's not helpful. Here's what I know. God doesn't cause cancer or sickness. Uh, the, the cells in the body, they, they divide and, and that's part of what causes cancer. God doesn't cause it. God, God doesn't cause the violence and war in our world. God, God doesn't cause these things. It's part of being human. It's part of what it means to, to live and walk on this earth. It's part of our experience. And when suffering happens, we are, we're deeply disappointed. And maybe we even walk away from faith. Here's the thing, the, the Christian faith, it doesn't promise we won't experience hardship or suffering. At the core of our faith is this, we follow someone who, who suffered and died on a cross. Jesus, who gave his life for us, who, who was dead and buried, and then on the third day rose again. We follow a, a a Messiah who, who gave it all up to the powers that existed, gave his very life that we might find new life. And I, I think about Paul too, the, the person that we're reading here, or, or at least his words that we're reading in the book of Romans, Paul knew suffering in his own life. You can read the, Acts, the end of Acts chapter 27 and 28, and, and you can read the story in 2 Corinthians as well. Uh, it describes Paul's journey the ways in which he was beaten by religious leaders who disapproved of his teaching. He was beaten with rods. He received a stoning. He was shipwrecked and imprisoned. He was in constant danger and hunger and thirst and sometimes even cold and, and naked. And so as we've been talking in the series about grit and grace, this is, this is the grittiness of life. Walking through pain and suffering, it does ask of us perseverance and endurance and long suffering. And it's just, it's just gritty, it, it hurts, but we're never far. We're never far from God's grace. God doesn't promise we won't experience suffering, but that in our suffering, in our suffering, he'll walk with us. Paul, he, he writes these words. He says, and we know, we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him 
who have, call, who have been called according to his purpose. This, this doesn't say that, that God makes all these things happen, but, but that whatever happens, God will work through it to bring about good for those who love him. In the book of Joel, I love how, how it's described there. In, in the Old Testament, the book of Joel uses the word rend, that, that God rends or wrings from injustice and hurt and pain goodness. God wrings from our hurt and pain his purpose. And, and something I've, I've learned, and, and you'll hear me say a lot, it, it comes from Fred, Fred, uh, Frederick Buechner, and, and it's this, the worst thing is never the last thing. The worst thing is never the last thing. And what this means is that the worst thing we experience, it's not the end of the story. The pain, the heartache, the suffering, the loss, it's, it's not the end. Not even death gets the final word. The worst thing is never the last thing. Jesus, he owned death, his own death. It wasn't the end of the story. His resurrection is just the beginning of the story even. The worst thing is never the last thing. If you're walking through a difficult season, if you find yourself suffering, I'd want you to know that you don't have to do it alone. I'd encourage you to talk to one of our campus pastors, to Pastor Rachel or Pastor Tom, Pastor Stephen, Pastor David, Pastor John. They, they love you and they can connect you to others. Know that we have resources available for you. You can go to grace.org care. And Pastor Sunny, she leads our care ministries across our campuses. We have groups like cancer support, uh, grief support, recovery support. We have benevolence opportunities and prayer and care. We can refer you to therapy and counseling and, and so much more. I want you to know that you do not have to walk alone and that there's a community of people that will love you and walk with you in this journey. So this, this leads us to Romans uh, chapter eight, verses 31 and 34. This is what Paul writes. What then? What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Nothing. Paul's saying nothing can be against us. If God is for us, nothing. There is nothing that can stand against us, nothing. And he goes on, what, who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Jesus is also there praying for us. Uh, and, then, and then Paul writes some of the most beautiful passages of scripture. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? Should any of that separate us from the love of Christ? Paul says, no. If you know you will face suffering and that Christ is with you, you, you can make it. If you know Christ can take pain and suffering and make beauty and good from it, you can make it, you can make it through. And when you look back at, at the painful moments and you look back and see how, how God redeemed it, how God worked through it, you can say, as Paul did, thank you, God. Paul, Paul ends, he ends with this. He says, for I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation, will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. I'll begin to close with a really wonderful story. It's, it's Cindy's story. She talks about pain and, and hurt and suffering uh, that she experienced, but, but also how God's love met her uh, take a listen. My name is Cindy Grove. I'm a librarian, and I absolutely am Cindy the Librarian on the YouTube chat. And please say hi. <laughs> I love interacting with people online. Faith was always a really big part of my life up until 1997, where I had some very unfortunate traumatic events that happened in my life kind of one after the other, and I no longer recognized myself after those events. I no longer recognized God, and went into this period of fear and hiding, and living life very operational. That, I thought, was working. I always felt like something, you know, wasn't right, but I was working. You know? 
And then in March of 2020, I unfortunately contracted a very severe case of COVID, which landed me in a Boston ICU. I wasn't allowed to leave my bedroom for a year after I got home. I decided sitting alone in my room that I really needed to figure out who I am. Because I always kept myself busy. I always kept myself, you know, getting the next degree, taking on this project, that project. I went on to YouTube. <laughs> That's when I gratefully stumbled upon Grace Online. It completely changed my life. But I feel like I've been, for the first time, truly introduced to God. And I feel Him beside me all the time in the good moments and the not so good moments. I still have a lot of challenges in front of me, a lot of health challenges in front of me, but I'm not worried about it anymore. I'm not. Even when I didn't want God in my life or even when I thought I didn't want God in my life, He was there. He never let go of me. It is by faith even when I didn't know it. I'm not just Cindy the Librarian, <laughs> but there's a whole lot more to me, and there's a whole lot more to come. I love one of the things that she said. She said, I, I feel him beside me all the time in the good moments and the not so good moments. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. It's it's also the work of the Holy Spirit in each of us, in, in you and me, to be there for each other when, not if, but when we experience suffering. And this takes practice. It takes practice through, through faith. It takes effort and, and work sometimes. Faith, especially in the, faith of, uh, in the face of suffering, is a practice in persistence and endurance and long suffering. Uh, one of the connection pathways we have here at Grace is the pathway to to grow with practice. Uh, what this means is that we, we worship together, we pray together, we, we learn and study scripture together. We allow God to wash over us, to make us new uh, in, through things like baptism and, and we care for one another, like a, a medical practice uh, that cares for its patients. We, we grow in our practice to love and care and walk alongside one another. You do not have to suffer alone. I think of some of you who needed to hear that today. Some of you needed to hear that God didn't cause your hurt, your loss, your grief, your suffering. God didn't cause those things, but God wants to walk with you through them. And God wants to use a community of people around you to love you and care for you through those, those situations. I, I have an image of God with, with big arms wrapped around us, holding us, never letting us go to remind us that nothing Nothing can separate us from his love. And, and for each of us, what we're meant to do is ask God, God, how can you use me? How can you use me to love and care for others? And so you might ask the Holy Spirit to guide you. Say, God, please use me to bring good from hardship and tragedy, to bring good from hurt. Use me to heal, to love, to care. And then when the Holy Spirit prompts you, you respond. You act. As we close today, I, I want to invite you to say this with me again. Nothing can separate us from the love of God through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Let's pray. Come, Holy Spirit. We pray that, that you would lead us and guide us, form us, shape us, mold us, fill us again, and renew us. Use us, O oh God, to be your hands and your feet, people who offer love and care, who extend grace to others and, and who notice, who pay attention where, to the places where people are hurting and suffering. God, for those of us who are walking through a difficult season, I pray that, that you would remind us you're never too far away. And it's your arms that wrap around us, your arms of comfort, and even in darkness, oh God, it's your light that points us to the hope we have in you. But it's also the light of, of others and a community around us who reminds us that, that we're never too far away from your love. God, I pray that, 
you use each and every one of us to be people of grace, to be people of healing and care, to be people of love, and that we would never be too far from the love of Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen.